from Los Angeles, California, this is Rising Up, and I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. Presidential candidate Hillary Clinton won the South Carolina primary race this weekend, drawing record numbers of African-American voters. The results led some in the Bernie Sanders' camp to ask questions like, why did black South Carolinians vote against their own interests? Clinton was under scrutiny recently for her past support of tough-on-crime legislation after a young black activist confronted her publicly with a placard quoting her use of the word super predators to describe black youth. Meanwhile, the 88th Academy Awards was in the news over the weekend, too. Not as much as for who won Best Actor, but for who was not nominated at all. People of color. Comedian Chris Rock, who emceed the event, unleashed a monologue that failed to hit the mark and drew even more criticism. Meanwhile, well-known black artists such as Ryan Coogler, Ava DuVernay, and Stevie Wonder made appearances at an event called Hashtag Justice for Flint, held to coincide with the Oscars. My guest is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American Studies and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Welcome to Rising Up, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. Thanks for joining us. Well, let's focus on the presidential race first. Clinton won by a landslide. 73.5% to Sanders is 26%. 62% of the voters were African American, and 84% of them cast ballots for Clinton. How do you explain these numbers? And in your opinion, did Clinton deserve this level of support from the community? Uh, well, you know, I, I would probably I would argue that she doesn't deserve black voter support any more than any other politician does, um, and particularly when we look at uh, the Clinton's record of supporting policies like the war on drugs, tough on crime legislation, uh, welfare reform and free trade agreements like NAFTA that have really just been disastrous for low income communities of color. Um, and I think that Black Lives Matter activists, as you pointed out, have really done a very good job of linking uh, the current crisis around police abuse, mass incarceration, uh, and growing unemployment and wealth inequality in low-income communities of color to policies that Hillary Clinton championed when her husband Bill Clinton was in office in the 1990s. So, you know, but I think in politics, in terms of understanding how it was that she was able to be so successful in South Carolina, you know, name recognition really goes a very long way. And in the South, where African-American voters vote overwhelmingly Democratic, uh, the Clinton name has been a household name for a very long time. And in the South, I think that Bernie Sanders for black voters in that region really remains something of an unknown quantity. A Jewish socialist from the Northeast, um, they don't know his record, they're not familiar with him, and so they voted for the person that they knew. Uh, and so it's not surprising that, that that was how things turned out. Well, Kevin Alexander Gray, who is a longtime radical activist and author based in South Carolina, said recently, quote, if you're going to come down here and you're going to run a northern liberal kind of campaign, if you come down here and you talk about revolution and movement, but your campaign doesn't look like the movement you claim to represent, I think people go with the devil you know. Is that a good explanation for why Sanders lost so badly, you think? I mean, I think that there's certainly an element of truth to that. The Sanders campaign, uh, particularly in the beginning, really struggled to establish a strong foothold with black communities. There were a number of really negative encounters with Black Lives Matter activists. And again, outside of the Northeast, I think that there's not a whole lot of name recognition for uh, for Bernie Sanders. I mean, African-American voters in the South really don't know who he is um, and uh, and don't really have a sense of, of you know, his record and, and the, the things that he's trying to promote. So, you know, I think that in the end, people do, vote, they do go with the devil that they know versus the devil that they don't know. Hmm. Let's turn to the Academy Awards. Um, in the lead up to the ceremony this past Sunday, the Oscars had gotten a lot of flack for not nominating any actors of color. There was a very strong social media campaign, hashtag Oscars so white. And I want to play for you and our audience some excerpts from the host Chris Rock's monologue. Woo! Man, I, I counted at least 15 black people on that montage. Is Hollywood racist? You're damn right Hollywood's racist. But if they nominated host, I wouldn't even get this job. <laughs> Should I y'all be watching Neil Patrick Harris right now? The last thing I need is to lose another job to Kevin Hart, okay? <laughs> say 62 or 63 and black people did not protest why because we had real things to protest at the time in the in memoriam package it's just going to be black people that were shot by the cops on their way to the movies there's no real reason for there to be a man in a woman category you know robert de niro's never said i better slow this acting down so meryl streep could catch up 
And those were just a few excerpts from a lengthy monologue that Chris Rock opened the Oscars with. And of course, he emceed the entire event. Uh, many aspects of what he said were problematic. But first, let's focus on the positive. Did you appreciate some of his comments on trying to confront racism, Courtney? Um, I mean, I think that there were high points in the evening where, uh, where Chris Rock was able to, to make some valuable interventions. And, you know, he came out in his opening monologue to fight the power, which is always a plus um, by public enemy. And so, but I think that that was probably one of the higher points of the evening. I think that, um, you know, there were moments where he did reinterpretations. Uh, he had black celebrities come in and do reinterpretations of many of the films that were nominated where they inserted black characters and sort of recreated them and, and trying to think about how the films would be different if they had black characters in them. And so moments like that I thought were actually really funny and very smart satire. Um, but most of the evening just felt like a missed opportunity. I mean, uh, it just, he didn't use that platform to really approach issues of representation and power in Hollywood in a meaningful way. The lynching and rape jokes were awful and even worse just not funny um, and the anti-Asian jokes just felt like cheap shots that fell really flat and so you know I think that it was really disappointing because Chris Rock's humor on race is usually brilliant um, and illuminating and this this wasn't that um, so at all. Fact, let's talk about some of those aspects where he did feel flat. One of them which we just heard earlier was that black people don't have serious enough issues to protest today compared to the 60s so they're going after the Oscars. I, that was pretty remarkable and and you're right that the lynching and rape jokes I, I don't even want to uh, recount them. They're just too terrible to even repeat. Um, mm -hmm. He also made a joke about Jada Pinkett Smith not being invited to the Oscars and a very crude joke about being invited into Rihanna's panties, which, you know, is just kind of sexist. Um, then the Asian jokes, the anti-Asian jokes, he brought three little boys on stage, two of them East Asian, saying that they were bankers from Price Waterhouse Coopers. And he, th he then joked about Chinese slave labor, saying, quote, if anyone's upset about that joke, just tweet about it on your phone that was also made by these kids. Was that just going way too far? Well, you know, I think that the whole event had the feeling of because the Academy knew that they had not nominated any act, any performers of color or technicians um, for, uh, for any of these awards that they were offering, they basically tried to use the event itself as a way of solving their diversity problem by basically having a bunch of tokens come up and put a better face on what was a really bad situation. And uh, Chris Rock, I think, played it very poorly. Um, and again, it just felt like a really missed opportunity. He could have done so much more with that platform and, and really failed to do so. Right. It wasn't just black actors that were completely left out. It was actors of any race. And just it was everybody. Out, and that wasn't white. <laughs> he was right about one thing. It was definitely the White People's Choice Awards. Yeah. So that was, that was one joke that certainly held up to scrutiny. Let's turn to another event that was held specifically to coincide with the Oscars. And that was this star-studded event called Justice for Flint, hosted by comedian Hannibal Buress, featuring acclaimed black filmmakers such as Ava DuVernay, Ryan Coogler, musicians like Stevie Wonder, and many others. I decided to watch that instead of the Oscars, and it was a wonderful, inspirational event. What did you make of it? And also, what did you make of the timing of it? I mean, I thought it was great, you know, in, in a sort of perverse way, maybe Chris Rock was, was right. You know, black people do have more important things to worry about. And that's why most of them didn't bother to even think about the Academy Awards and were much more interested in the Justice for Flint benefit um, and using their, you know, their celebrity, their resources and their platform to promote uh, that cause, right? And really bringing attention to what's taking place in Flint. And I thought it was just a beautiful gathering of artists and activists. Um, there were testimonies from people who live in Flint and what they've been going through uh, with the water crisis there. Um, and it was just a really lovely gathering to see people like Ryan Coogler and Ava DuVernay, who have been completely shut out of the Academy Awards, using their celebrity to support uh, the movement for environmental justice in Flint. And, you know, I think that these were people who were denied a place at the table in Hollywood and decided to make their own table that they didn't need to beg for a spot at somebody else's table, that they could use their time supporting causes that they really care about rather than trying to uh, gain access to a system that really has no room for, uh, for them and the communities that they represent in their work. And I'm so glad you brought up uh, this issue of uh, Ava DuVernay, especially who has said in the past that instead of trying to get a seat at a white dominated table to create, you know, that communities can create their own alternative uh, award ceremonies, their own alternative industries. And she has really spearheaded that. Yet she is also one of the few filmmakers of color that is allowed to break into mainstream filmmaking. Uh, do you think she's done it while staying very true to her ideals? 
I think she's absolutely maintained her integrity. You know, Hollywood is a world that if you want to get your, your films out there, if you want to have a larger platform, if you want to have greater distribution, it's a bit of a necessary evil. You do have to have a foothold in that world. But I think it's very important for artists of color um, to create their own infrastructure um, and to be able to share their work in ways that maybe are not supported or recognized by the mainstream. And sometimes, you know, just like we're seeing with Black Lives Matter, the mainstream might not pay attention to you at first, but if you make enough noise and you have enough support, you can force the mainstream to shift their focus to where it should be. Um, and I think that's exactly what these artists are doing. So finally, since we're discussing representation in the media, um, I think we all suffered a major loss also over the weekend when Melissa Harris Perry's show was taken off the air by MSNBC. This is a, an incredibly uh, intellectually strong uh, woman of color. She's the author of many books. She's a professor. She went on strike to protest repeated preemptions of her show um, for election coverage. Even though she herself was also covering the election separately, she released a scathing email and her show was canceled. Now, she was already just one of the only women of color to host a nationally syndicated news talk show. And of course, she's staunchly progressive. Does this move mean that media has no room for women like her? I mean, it's, it's hard not to feel that way when we see the media shutting people of color out um, at every level, from films to, uh, to mass you know, news media. Um, and I think that it's essential to have people like Melissa Harris Perry on the air because it's really the only way that issues that matter to communities of color ever get any airtime. Um, there was actually a recent study, as I was following the story with Melissa Harris Perry, I looked up a study by Media Matters, um, which is a, pro a progressive media watchdog organization. And they said that the Melissa Harris Perry show for two years in a row single-handedly had the highest number of non-white guest experts on any television network in the country, right? They had, it was something like 67% of her guests were non-white people of color, you know, people of color. Um, compare that to 16% by CBS, NBC, and Fox News, right? So I think it's really frustrating and sad to see one of the sharpest, one of the smartest uh, voices in, uh, in television news be uh, pushed out in such a demeaning uh, and dismissive way. But, you know, she's a resilient sister, and I have a feeling that um, this won't be the last that we'll hear from Melissa Harris Perry. Let's hope so. Courtney Morris, I want to thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your insight with us. My pleasure. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. This is Rising Up. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. I'll see you next time. Rising Up with Sonali is hosted, written, and executive produced by Sonali Kolhatkar. Anna Bus is the producer, technical director, and web and social media supervisor. Our theme music is by Grammy award-winning band, Gets Up. Like us on Facebook.com slash RU with Sonali. That's the letters RU with Sonali. And follow us on Twitter.com slash RU with Sonali. Our website is risingupwithsonali.com where you can find all our programs archived and where you can get direct access to all our video and audio files.